Good morning students, this is Mr. Boscarini and for our unit on forces today we're going to see Newton's first law of motion and the objective of this lesson will be to explain what happens to an object when balance forces act on it and really the key word here you'll see will be balanced and we'll explain more about that in a minute and our key question today is really do we need a force to keep an object in motion and we will see how through the ages uh, scientists have given different answers to this question but let's start with what is our everyday experience so let's go back to our exam first example of a force someone kicking a ball now when we kick a ball we apply a pushing force the, the ball will move will move and eventually will roll on the ground and what is our experience the, our experience is that that rolling will eventually slow down and at some point the ball will stop so it's pretty obvious that unless you keep on kicking it and, and uh, unless you keep on pushing it applying a force at, at some point the ball will stop moving so here we have a problem which had different answers through the ages and uh, you see here two people and one of these uh, persons is this gentleman over here someone we already met in our lesson about free fall it's the Greek philosopher Aristotle and again based on what we see every day based on our everyday experience Aristotle's answer to our previous question was you need the force to keep an object in motion because eventually the object will uh, slow down and stop if you want to keep it moving you always need to apply a force and you will see that uh, the big mistake of Aristotle like in the case of free fall was not taking into account what we now know as friction as the frictional forces many many centuries later this guy over here, Sir Isaac Newton, and his famous apple, as you can see, uh, gave a very different answer. What he says is that if the force are balanced, here you have that key word again, the object will keep moving at a constant velocity. And it's very, very important here that we use the word velocity and not speed. Because remember, velocity is not only the how fast you go but also the direction in which you're moving but more about that in a few minutes so let's see an example a more complex example of movement and here we have a cyclist and what do you see what I've done here it's a force diagram and actually I represented not two forces like we have seen so far but four which is actually what we will see most of the times. So let's look at these forces. Let's well, let's start with the vertical ones. First of all, we have the downward pull of gravity, which you also know is weight. And here I'm. Um, this is very important. I'm considering the, the whole system of a cyclist and the bicycle. So this is the overall weight of cyclist, all his equipment, and the bicycle as well. So we have this arrow starting from a cyclist and pointing down. The second force is the force from the ground. Uh, we always uh, forget about this force. Even when we're standing, there's always a force which is pushing up upwards. Otherwise, we will sinking into the ground. Imagine what would happen if this force was not there. The cyclist will go down. So there's always an upward force opposing the pull of gravity these two forces are balanced if this was not the case the cyclist will either go down sinking in the ground or flying up in the air so let's look at the other two forces the horizontal ones now this one with more air resistance also known as air drag or air friction this is a force which is always po pointing backwards is always opposing the motion of an object okay every time you move there is some form of air resistance 
And finally, we have the forward push of a cyclist. He's pedaling, pedaling all the time. He's trying to push his bicycle forward. Now, uh, as you probably have experienced, because I assume everyone has done some cycling at some point of your life, um, you know that um, you need to keep cycling if you want to keep the bicycle moving, unless you're going downhill. But even when you're going on a flat ground, you need to keep pushing on the pedals, otherwise the bicycle will eventually slow down. And actually, what happens, um, even when you're pedaling, sometimes you're just going at the same speed, at the same velocity, I should say. So in principle, it seems that our friend Aristotle was right. If, if, if you don't keep on pushing, you will slow down. But again, guys, the point is really, is air resistance. Because if you take this away, you only have this force, which is eventually making you go slower and slower. To really understand that uh, Newton was right and not uh, Aristotle, we have again to go where we have no air resistance, actually where we have no opposing force. And no better example is than space probes. And actually the example here is the Voyager 1 and 2 space probes. With both of them were launched in 1977. That means exactly 40 years ago. And here you have a timeline of these two probes. Uh, August the 20th, Voyager 2. September the 5th, Voyager 1. And, and these space probes were sent, as you can see here from this diagram, to visit some of the planets which are more far away from us. And eventually, they have reached the edges of our solar system. So they're still moving. Actually, they're going very, very fast. We're moving at a more than 10 kilometers per second. And just to give you an idea, these objects are also pretty big. Um, the um, antenna dish you see here, the parabola, has a diameter of almost 4 meters. So you can imagine the whole object is pretty big. Nevertheless, it's going very, very fast. It's been going very, very fast for 40 years. So. If Aristotle was right, it means there's something that still keep pushing the Voyagers. That's not true. The Voyagers are going at an almost constant velocity because there's nothing that slows them down. Okay? And this is really the point from Newton. If you don't have any opposing force, if you already have some velocity, you will keep that velocity. Of course, I'm um, not taking into account that there's still a little bit of pull of gravity from the sun, but where these probes are, that pull now is very, very faint. So we can imagine they're really going at a constant velocity because there's no force acting on them. So, I hope at this point I've convinced you of uh, Newton's argument. So, we're going to see um, the laws of Newton. Today, we'll start with the first law. In 1687, and that's the date here, if you can read Roman numerals, Sir Isaac Newton published his most famous piece of work, The Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which sounds very impressive as a title. And, first of all, why in Latin? I mean, he was British, he was English, no? But you have to think that even at the time of Newton, Latin was still the language of a learned. If you were a learned person, if you were a scientist, a mathematician, you would read in Latin, you would write in Latin, you would speak in Latin to other scientists. So this is the reason why Isaac Newton, like all his contemporaries, wrote in Latin. So the whole book, actually books, was published in Latin. Here you see the cover of the first edition. Nowadays, of course, we do prefer having a translation in English. And this is the cover of actually the edition I have. 
they, they call it just the Principia, and this is in English. And, and you might think this title is very impressive, but actually, what does it mean? I think you can figure out it's something about nature, it's about math, it's about philosophy, and more readily you can just translate it as the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. And basically, you're writing, you're reading it backwards. Um, but we can make it even easier than that because what does principle means? It means the basis, the foundation. So, and just translate this into the mathematical foundations. And what is natural philosophy has nothing to do with biology has more to do with that's actually how at the time they called physics so if newton's was here today and he were to publish his book again he would probably have called it the mathematical foundations of physics okay and as i told you i have the english version here and if you have it you'll see it's really about geometry a lot about math it's very little about what you would call now physics so what is this famous first law and here you have it of course in the original version in latin and what does it says corpus omne perseverare in statu suo quescendi vel movendi uniformiter indirectum nisi quaternus a viribus impressis cogitur statum illum mutare which is very very impressive but actually it says that everybody will keep in its state of rest or of moving in a uniform direction unless there is um, a force applied on it which will change its state. But I think at this point we're ready for a more modern version of this law. So, and here you have it. Actually, in many textbooks, you'll find different uh, versions of his laws. When you go to college, actually, we'll have a more deep version of this. But for now, we'll have you like this. And as you can see, it's very, very long because it shows you two possible scenarios. Scenario number one, you have an object out moving. And it says, no external force is applied on it. means... All the, or you can also say all the forces acting on that object are balanced. So what happens? The object will just keep at rest. Will just stay there. No, you have an object which is not moving. You don't do anything to that object. The object will just stay there. No big deal. But what is really the breakthrough is the second part. What happens if you have an object moving and the forces are balanced? The object will keep on moving, and not in any way. It will keep on moving at a constant velocity. Remember, velocity means the same speed and the same direction. That is the big difference between Aristotle and Isaac Newton. And just to give you a very, very quick glimpse into what we're going to do in class, two scenarios. Felix Baumgartner jumped from the edge of the atmosphere in free fall and when he's on the ground not moving the only two forces are the weight and the push of the ground he's not moving first law forces are balanced his speed will still be low. but when you're going in free fall actually when you're doing skydiving not free fall in the same sense we said previously you have again two forces you have a weight and you have a resistance, which is a force that increases with speed. At some point, every skydiver will find himself in a situation where these two forces are balanced. Does it mean he stops moving in midair? No, he'll just keep on moving with a constant speed. We call this speed terminal velocity. And we'll see more about terminal velocity in class. But for today, that's all from Mr. Boscarini. Goodbye.